Okay, welcome everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome you to this uh, last seminar of the series for this year. Before we get going, as always, want to thank Howard Weider, the Canada Excellence Research Chair, for underwriting the seminar series and the Global Institute for Water Security. And it's a real pleasure to have Richard Vogel here from Tufts University. Richard's a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, and he's been at Tufts since about 1984, I think. He got his uh, PhD from Cornell University in Water Resource Systems, and uh, before that was bachelor's and master's at University of Virginia, also in uh, systems analysis, water resource systems, engineering systems. And Rich has really been a thought leader in this area of water resource engineering, uh, statistical analysis in water resource systems. Uh, he's received the John W. Oliver Leadership Award from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, the Julian Hines Award from ASCE, American Society of Civil Engineering, uh, the Walter L. Huber Award uh, for Civil Engineering, uh, a research prize also from ASCE. Uh, He's been the Borland Lecturer at AGU Hydrology Days at uh, Colorado State University, and uh, while he's not director now, he's served as director of the Tufts Graduate Program in, in water, uh, water Systems for a number of years. Uh, so, uh, Richard is, is uh, really a, a, a terrific final, we saved the best for last here, I think, in terms of the seminar series. He's been really uh, made a lot of uh, splash in the media. This is an Atlantic article that came out, uh, I think, a year or two ago, oh, 2011. And I just wanted to read you a, a quick quote, because he's been talking with some of the uh, uh, SENS folks and others in talking about interdisciplinary science through the day. And this was an interview he gave, I guess, in the, with The Atlantic uh, in this 2011 piece. And I just want to make this quote on interdisciplinary programs, because I think it's really uh, relevant to many of us in the room dealing with interdisciplinarity. Interdisciplinary programs must stress languages like English, history, computing, statistics, systems analysis, and economics, which apply to everything, thus making it possible to cross disciplines. Without a common language, interdisciplinary education is simply a blend of disciplines without a way to connect them. And I think this will probably uh, feature prominently in his talk in terms of bringing some of these various communication tools. And one last thing in this, this Atlantic article, which I encourage you to look at, uh, the last question by the interview is, what song has been stuck in your head lately? And uh, his response was the theme song to the Beverly Hillbilly. So maybe we'll... we'll We'll hear more about that after the talk is over. <laughs> Richard. Careful what you put on your website. <laughs> I had forgotten about that a long time ago. Well, I am delighted. I'm honored to actually be here and uh, give this lecture. And it really uh, means a lot to me to come here and uh, really thank uh, Jeff uh, for, for hosting me and others. And I've really enjoyed meeting so many of you this morning. And in particular, it's a very special place in my heart here. You have the National Hydrology Research Center, one of the, uh, the you know, that's the hydrology center for the entire uh, country of Canada here in Saskatoon. And it's not only in, uh, uh, you know, for the entire uh, country, but it's here on the campus. And, and, and another reason why that's so special to me was Vit Klemish, who is one of my heroes, really. He's a a legend of hydrology, and I don't know how many of you know him, but Vit Klemish was here, and you should read Vit Klemish. Um, so I'm going to speak about hydrologic design in the Anthropocene, and I've listed all kinds of other people because they all played a role in the slides. They're either graduate students, uh, former graduate students, or, or um, uh, colleagues. Uh, and you know, this is a mix of a few ideas today. Um, uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to introduce you to some of the thoughts of, of a, a field of hydromorphology, which uh, I'll try and define to you. And then I'm going to talk about what I, I really believe firmly that hydrology needs uh, revision. Um, and there are some fundamental things that are needed, and so many I couldn't possibly go through them all today. But I can talk about two of them. First of all, how to deal with non-stationary flood frequency analysis, and only a little bit of that as well. Uh, just a part of that, but also, more importantly, actually, especially for this audience, is the application of deterministic, and I put quotes around deterministic because I don't believe there is such a thing as a deterministic model, um, and I think I'll hopefully convince you of that. They are used 
widely now for everything under the sun, for everything that hydrologists even think about doing, and for good reason, and will always be hopefully used. And they should, you know, and, and so we should take them very seriously. And I want to tell you why and how we could do that more seriously. Um, so uh, first, let's just, just, just very quickly go through uh, sort of what, what this branch of hydrology called hydromorphology is. Well, I would argue it's a new branch of hydrology. And why? I just want to not put my, sorry, I want to put my watch out here so I can see it. Um, think about geomorphology and geology. Geomorphology is a sub-discipline of geology, um, just, like geomorpholo just like hydromorphology would be a sub-discipline of hydrology. And what, what do I mean by that? Well, geomorphology really is about the structure and the evolution of processes on the Earth. And it actually started as a, uh, you know, geology was a, di didn't need geomorphology until they noticed things got a little more complicated and that there wasn't just the core of the earth, there was more, more to it. And so after uh, about 100 years, they formed this new subdiscipline. Well, I would argue the same is true here. Um, the evolution of Earth's topography is due to both natural and anthropogenic influences, geomorphology. It's a very uh, significant field. Well, similarly, I would argue that hydromorphology deals with um, the structure and evolution of hydrologic systems due to complex coupling between human and natural systems. And we all know that you couldn't, you know, ignore those. Uh, human influences are pervasive. I always love this picture from the New York Times. Can you imagine what's under the street in New York City? I mean, or any of these cities that were, you know, just imagine how complicated they are. Virgin watersheds really don't exist anymore. It's just a, you know, something we, we dream up as hydrologists. Uh, pristine watersheds don't exist. And, you know, maybe even stationarity doesn't exist, perhaps. I would always argue that we should consider it both ways. I don't talk too much about that today. But just look at, you know, it's, it's obvious that things have changed. Um, the, the Colorado rivers practically run dry back in the uh, 60s due to, uh, no, well, there's just so many reasons for that I won't bother. And all this was just as an introduction to what I'm going to talk about anyway. Probably you all know all this already. It's impossible to ignore impacts. We can't deal with the hydrologic textbook, which only looks at the uh, hydrologic cycle without humans. It's no longer possible. It doesn't it's not representative. Our models without humans are no longer representative. And, and, and so it deals with impacts of humans on those systems. By the way, that's a, on the right, that is a river, the Ipswich River in, in Massachusetts during September, one of the most stressed basins in the country. Uh, and that's a reservoir in Massachusetts on the, uh, uh, is also under uh, stress. But of course, it's also impacts not just of uh, humans on water, but impacts of water on humans, both water pollution, water scarcity, and those are certainly the biggest water challenges of the 21st century. So I'd argue all of that. It's a field, basically a word that we might sort of steal for ourselves, needs definition. Uh, you can look in geology, it's got 63 million hits, geomorphology 3.2, hydrology 10 million. Hydromorphology is a word that needs a home. So anyway, I, I'll, I'll ask you. I've, I, I've had, we've had some trouble, we had a team of us try to put these ideas forward, but it gets very political to try to create a new field. So I just wrote a, a, an editorial, and I'll tell you the story as well. I'll leave the younger people here to decide whether or not we're going to have a field, or whether we even need another field, because we have so many already. Uh, but that said, we have to do something about the fact that these problems are really just beginning, and we're just beginning to have to deal with them. So let's really start talking about something tangible. Let me talk about something where we can put our hands on it. Um, this is not a real flood. This is a pretend flood, the Golden Gate flood, go Golden Gate. And I could tell you why we need to do all this. I probably don't really need to tell you that much about why floods damages are increasing. We don't really know, actually, is wh whether it's our fault. Nobody ever faults the hydrologists. Is it because w people don't understand what a 100-year flood? I think in a few minutes you might answer yes, that's part of the problem. Is it because we ignore non-stationarity? Yes, many times that could easily be the problem. What should we do differently? Um, well, uh, let me talk about that. Um, we, we need to do all sorts of things differently. Um, but let, let's start here with uh, what people are doing in, in the US. I'm 
you know, obviously focusing in this, uh, uh, on some U.S. data here in the, in the first part of the talk. This is the guidelines for flood frequency analysis, which is really a, what mandates the techniques that hydrologists use for almost all flood frequency um, problems, for, for designing culverts, for you name it, treatment, you know, the size of a wall on a tr water treatment plant uh, to prevent f the fl flooding, and you name it. The thing about this Bulletin 17B, which is just about to come out as Bulletin 17C, is it still says, and it probably will, won't change much, it says climatic time invariance was assumed when developing this guide. Interestingly, I, I could show you the same thing with the National Weather Service, uh, NOAA Atlas, uh, which has just been released for almost every part of the United States. Same, same basic statement. In other words, the uh, frequency analysis of rainfall in the United States has not been updated <laughs> to include climate to impact changes yet. Yet, the National Climate Data Set of the same institution as the National Weather Service is on the front page of the New, you know, the New York Times and the Times Magazine telling us that there are more storms every year. Who do we believe? The same agency, the one that works, collects the data, says that rainfall is increasing, and yet the one that makes the maps that hydrologists and design engineers use to make predictions didn't assume any trends. You know, which is, who is right? What's going on? Well, actually, that problem is more about semantics. It turns out that the storms that are actually increasing are very small storms. And hydrologists only look at the largest storm in every year. The other, the national uh, NCDC looks at the top five, six, eight storms every year. And those are increasing. But the top storm every year doesn't seem to be markedly increasing anywhere in the United States. Quite interesting. I'm not saying it's not changing. I'm just telling you that it's a quandary. And there are consequences to all this. <laughs> you either, you know, build the thing too low or too high. You do all sorts of things. So let's, let's look at some consequences. I like, I know, uh, Jeff, I've been really impressed, and it doesn't surprise me, a field hill slope hydrologist is going to spend a lot of time collecting data in the field and in laboratories. This is my laboratory right here. It's a watershed of 24 uh, square miles. It's the same watershed, if you want to learn about, that was the topic of the uh, movie called A Civil Action with John... John uh, Travolta, as the uh, was about a water quality problem, pollution problem. That place is about two miles from my office. It uh, it is now mostly at, you know 40 years ago when they started collecting data was almost all rural. It's now almost all residential, commercial, and industrial. So since the U.S. Geological Survey started collecting data in 1940, it has just like clockwork, they've been cutting trees down and replacing the trees with pavement, ro you know, roads, parking lots, sidewalks, and rooftops. And what has happened is this. This is just the data. This is just the daily stream flow data from 1940 to 12, tw 2012. And what you can see there is that every stream flow is getting bigger. You can see that much more clearly if you look even more closely at just the largest events each year. I hate it when people sh look, show me pictures like this because they often want to, well, it's okay to look at that picture, but you don't ever want to model those flows because the, the, y what you want to do is look at that picture differently. And you'll see, just in a minute, just remind yourselves that picture. That's in real space. Look at the flows. The largest flow is about 1,600 CFS. Let's try and remember that. Um, that was, you know, around 2002 or so. I'll, I'll show you. You'll be seeing a lot of plots like this. Um, you could do a frequency analysis of all the annual maximum flows in each of the decades. And what you find is that, you know, back in the 40s, a frequency analysis would look like that. And the 100-year flood, which is the, the one that's exceeded 99% of the time, uh, sorry, it's exceeded 1% of the time. It's not exceeded 99% <laughs> of the time. And that, that was, you know, very low back then, less than 1,000. And then now, more recently, it's gone up to almost 16, 1,700. So the 100-year flood is systematically going up, and nobody's surprised by that. All the textbooks will tell you. You, you know, you, you, you replace trees with pavement, you get more runoff, you get more floods. Big deal. This is actually a little bit interesting. Why I show you this is, 
is that this is a flow duration curve, which means it's every one of the flows that you saw f uh, over the entire period of record. And the, so the, the, the lowest one are just all the fl daily flows ranked um, over the two decade, decadal period. And what you see now is all the flows. So I was just looking at just those really big ones, which I couldn't really show you on here. But all of the flows are just systematically going up. And why is that? Well, you can read the textbooks and they all say different things. First of all, the textbooks all tell you that urbanization will decrease stream flow. Why? Because that as you add more pavement, you have less water entering the ground, which means, and most of the water that comes from these low flows, these are very low flows. Notice one, two, three, four, that's actually like five, almost five orders of magnitude change. This is very complicated data, daily stream flows, like this everywhere. Daily flows are look like this all around the world. Or four or five orders of magnitude. These very small stream flows, they, they argue, come only from um, groundwater. And there must be less groundwater if there's all that water that ran off. Well, what have they forgot to tell us? It's much more complex than that. Because when we cut the trees down, we stop funneling water from the ground, from the soil, to the atmosphere. In other words, we stop the evapotranspiration. Evapotranspiration tends to reduce the stream flow. So when we stop tra evapotranspiration, we get big increases. So it's a complicated problem. There's also infrastructure problems that, you know, they more stormwater, but largely, and by the I am not showing you, but it is not climate change. I could show you all the data you'd like. I tried very hard to find, to, to be able to say that this is due to increases in precipitation, but it's not. There's no evidence at all of increases in precipitation. We've got some papers on that if you're interested. All right, so let's start looking at data this way. This is just, a, I, I want to do this, this take you through a, um, for a few minutes, a little, a few studies that I did um, and some analysis. This is stuff that's already published in every, a lot, a number of the, the first half of this lecture is stuff that I've published on already, mostly little bits and pieces. And then the second half is all, it hasn't been published. And it's on a different topic. Um, but I like to show this, first of all, you notice it's the same, it's the same plot as before in the sense that it's the flows, the annual maximum flow in every year versus time. But I just was very careful, uh, the, the statistician in me, to plot them, the log of the flows, because it turns out that model is much more representative in the sense if I'm going to try to model the flows. And I don't ever tell anyone to model something versus time because that's just nonsense because time is not an explanatory variable. I, I mean, I should put something like uh, urban urban characteristics, and I should have some features of the watershed, which we do in our uh, subsequent papers. But right now, just for the purposes of trying to show you something, I'm modeling, just looking at whether there's a trend. One, uh, 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 it's very uh, easy to do a statistical analysis on this because, um, because the residuals, the errors around the line are very well behaved, and so I can actually uh, talk about uh, significance of that trend and so forth. But the most important thing I want to tell you right now is that that line, and this is a theme through today, that line in any model, any model of data, I don't care what kind of model you have, is just a conditional mean. So that's a theme for today. You'll see that at the end of the, my next subject, which has nothing to do with this, is all about the line or the model being just all the conditions. The, 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 the model does not explain the data. It's not trying, I'm not trying to, here I'm not trying to explain the data with the model. I'm just trying to represent the change in the mean. That's all I'm trying to do here. If I wanted to actually model the, the change in the data, I would have to add error because the error around that line is just as important as the line. In fact, the error explains almost 80% of this, and I wouldn't expect R squared to be very large. I'm actually really surprised that <laughs> there's even 20, that you could explain 20% of the increase due to probably urbanization. I mean, the rest is due to natural variability, due to changes every year in rainfall and what you'd expect. So of course there'd be error. But this, what I'm arguing right now, and I said a little bit more than I need to, is just that, that this model provides an excellent representation for this particular site of the change in flows historically over time. And it would have been very misleading to assume a constant mean. Now, why, wh 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 why is this important? Well, first of all, I also like to promote simple methods, and I'm promoting regression. It's very simple. It considers non, that was a, base, by the way, this is a highly nonlinear trend. If I plotted 
That's highly nonlinear. You take, it's an exponential model is what it is. I use regression, linear regression, a very simple technique. It's easy to use. You can, you, you can model nonlinear trends. You can see it. You can model the trend in the mean and the variability, the coefficient of variation. You can, very important, you can talk about type 1 and type 2 errors. I'm going to talk to you about that for a minute. You can create prediction intervals. Now, why is that important? Here's the picture. This has got it all. Not only does it have the model of the flows over time, same thing, but it shows the confidence intervals that I have. Those are actually prediction intervals associated with the da data. So you, that, that shows how you might, those are intervals which will enclose future observations. And it shows how wide and how much uncertainty there is if I was to actually use this model to do any kind of extrapolation. So I always tell students, you know, they ask me, do I have enough data? Of course you do. Just do the statistics correctly. If you do the statistics correctly, it tells the truth. The truth is that there are those prediction intervals, if you go out and use this in practice, they get really wide and nobody will believe them. Fine, so don't use it. But show the prediction intervals. Always show, t what does that mean? That means there's a 47% that we could be rejecting, we, that you'll see in a minute. I'll, I'll make it clear, because so, I don't want to confuse anybody right now with type 2 errors. I'll make it really formal. There's a big probability of a type 2 error. That means we don't really know much. Even though we think there's a trend, we don't know much. What, are we what is it we don't know? Listen to this. This is quite a story. Everyone that has ever looked at trends in climate variables or floods that I have seen has performed statistics, hypothesis, and I've done, I've looked at this a long time, hypothesis tests. And they have always assumed no trend in floods is the null hypothesis. Why do they do that? It's because the only reason I can come up with is because it's the most common test in a statistics text. You look up any, t if you want to look, do trend testing, the null hypothesis is always no trend. Why is this important? It's a ridiculous null hypothesis. Why? Because if I do the test and I'm, you know, I, I decide that there's, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a trend, but in fact there wasn't a trend, and this is all we focus on in, in all of the trend studies, it means I might actually do something when I didn't have to. It's like maybe I'll build, a, maybe I'll make the elevator cable too strong. Maybe I will, you know, over-design something or over-protect the environment. Shouldn't we be much more worried about this one? If there is a trend, what happens if we miss it? Isn't that much more important if there really was a trend? This is the number that I just showed you on the previous page. Nobody ever reports it. They don't even know how to calculate it. Isn't it amazing that I can tell you this story, that all previous stu studies have, <laughs> have assumed the null hypothesis of no trend? Isn't it amazing that even though our primary concern is, uh, is um, uh, um, is o our, our primary concern, societal concern, right now has always been, you know, with this, when in f which is over-designed. In other words, w why, have we, why haven't we shifted the problem around to concern ourselves more with the type 2 error? And why isn't there more attention to this? And so we have a few papers on this that came out recently that are, I'll formalize all this if you're interested. But it's, to me, it's a remarkable issue that it pervades the entire literature, and it, has to, and it just proves to me right away, I can tell immediately how much training that people that wrote the study had. If you don't know anything about type 2 errors, it just tells me, you know, you know they have only had a course maybe or two. Or, you know, how do you know about type 2? You have to learn how to derive type 2 errors. It's, 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 it's not trivial necessarily, but it's certainly not beyond your abilities. Um, so here, let me, let me show you what the consequences of some of this are. Let's take that tre a trend model. The trend model that I just showed you can be combined with a log normal model. I, you'll have to, you want to read some stuff. It turns out floods are well approximated by a two-parameter log normal model. In fact, that was the uh, distribution of choice in America, except they went with log Pearson type 3, which is just a generalization of the log normal. 
but the guy who did the original study wanted to go with log normal, but all the agencies had already been using log Pearson, so by caveat, they stuck with that. But it's a wonderful model. It works perfectly well. Now, the design event, the size that we're going to make the structure is now a function of time. So this is non-stationary flood frequency analysis. This is where it gets tricky, right? But you can also include a trend in the variance if you want. Right now, we're assuming the variance is constant. That's a whole other story. This is what it looks like when you look at this particular problem and you look at the, the, um, the data uh, and, and, and the distribution, the probability distribution of the flows on this particular river. I'm, it's always, my case is always the average owner river. Um, and if you assume a, a, a constant mean, a stationary, you know, just, you just calculate the mean and you don't do a trend. This is if you assume there's a trend in the mean and you move to 2012 and say, what's the mean in 2012? What I would always argue is, this is, please, please, Bulletin 17, please revise your statements and please tell people to update the design flood to current conditions for urban basins. At the very least, there's no question whether this is happening in urban basins. We know the physics enough. For climate change, it's not so obvious. It's more complicated. Then you're going to have to read our other study by Rossner et al., the one I alluded to a minute ago. It's more that if you're interested in really how to do this in a decision context, which I'm not covering today, you'll have to read one of these studies that I've mentioned by Rossner, Anna Rossner, who's now with the U.S. Geological Survey, what I'm not covering today. Um, so you can see the difference is really quite remarkable in terms of whether or not you're going to use a flood of this size versus this. And this is real consequences because this river actually floods and has actual flooding da flood damages and they just spend a $30 million on a you know, flood project uh, and, and they were using this number. Um, so they're still not believing us or, or whatever. Um, so here, let me talk a little more about uh, what the consequence is and now let's be more, more general. A very simple result for the log normal model is that if you consider the magnification factor, that's the, si the ratio of the flood in, ten year, in delta T years to now, right? So just think about it. It's, the, it's just the flood, the 100 year flood T is the, t is the return period in delta T years compared to the size of the flood today. So that's what it is. And, um, and let's, for, the, for our purposes today, take delta T as a decade. So we'll look at decadal. But it turns out for, non -state, for the model I've just showed you, you can easily show that, the, that it only depends on the slope of the model, the, of the trend. It doesn't depend on anything else. It's actually a very elegant result and the length of the period. That's the so this, I'm going to look at this value of magnification for every river, for every flow that's ever been observed in the United States in a minute. First, let's do it for the one I showed you. It turns out that the M is 1.16. It would be 1 if there was no trend. What this means is that the floods on this river have increased at the rate of about 16% per decade. All of them. Every, in the log, log no, normal model would say that all the floods every, of every magnitude. And I've done this, we've looked at 21,000 rivers, um, and this is just four basins in, in New England. Uh, th you know, whether or not they actually have a trend or not, I don't really care. This one probably has a trend. This one probably has a trend. This one probably has no trend, right? Because this is a 1% chance if it didn't have a trend that it would you get data like that. I mean, these neither of these probably have trends. This one is too small a data set, probably. This one has enough data. And it, it, so you get all kinds of results, but this model is a beautiful model for evaluating these results. So similar plots were made all over, and it seemed like it's a really good approximation. So then what we did is we plotted these magnification factor for, in this case, 15,000 gauges um, across the US. And this is, there's another paper on this. You can see this in the Vogel in the paper in 2011. And what you find is some really big magnification factors of like two to five. Big numbers. And where are they occurring? This is Los Angeles. This is, look, where, let's put an overlay. This is a population map in the background. This is really mostly places where people live. You know, this is, you know, this is mostly places, the magnification factors are mostly in areas that have urbanized heavily. Um, this is only the rivers that are what are called a special selection of only 1,500 gauges 
which have been called by the US Geological Survey, HCDN, that means they're hydroclimatological data network, which are sites which are not heavily influenced by any, um, any kind of withdrawals, um, primarily, uh, or uh, possibly some land use. Notice you get some magnification factors, very few large ones. In fact, if you look at those results, the HCDN results, the magnification factors, are much smaller. So these are only changes that might have been induced by climate, primarily. And these are all that might have been induced by regulation, land use, all kinds of things. They let the data speak for itself. What this says is that the magnitude of climate-induced flood trains are minimal compared, and I'm not a climate naysayer. I try to do this. I try to do my best to find the very much, as much as I can to see what's happening with this climate and how it's influencing trends. But be careful when it comes to trends. Now, what are the consequences of that? Well, you know, what, what the consequences are is this should be in everybody's uh, introductory textbook in hydrology. The return period, T, is the time until the next flood. It's either going to happen or it's not. It's going to happen in T years then the first t minus one years, it's not going to happen. And then it's going to happen. So that's just the geometric distribution, and that's the probability distribution. It turns to, I don't know if you know this, but you should, that that's where this comes from. The expected value of a geometric is 1 over p. And that's why the average time you wait till the first flood is, 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 is distributed like this, always exponential. In other words, it's very likely it's going to come early, less and less likely, and the average time is just 1 over p. That's stationary flood frequency. That's true of all natural hazards that occur with a fixed uh, probability of exceedance. It's not true of things that change. Not true of anything where the probability of exceedance is changing. This assumes P is constant in every year. That's not true under non-stationarity. That's not true for manufactured devices or for you and your insurance, the health insurance, when they ca calculate your, uh, the expected life which is the same problem, by the way, the expected life or the expected life of a, uh, you know, there's also, we have a, uh, uh, anyway, never mind. Um, so, um, but in a world in flux, here's an example, okay, just, you know, this is using simulation here, just, to, cause it's just a way of just showing what would happen if we simulated floods. A hundred year floods do exactly what you'd expect from the theory, but if, you take a log normal case with just a small magnification factor. Look what happens to the time to the next flood. It's not exponential anymore. You can't define it using return period because it needs more than just the, just the average alone is not reflective no, any longer because it's not always the same. It's not a one parameter distribution, basically. More importantly, it changes all kinds of complex ways, depending on and what used to be a 100-year flood is now a 43-year flood. What used to be a 1,000-year flood is now just about a 100-year flood. And look at the time to the event. The shape of the changes completely when you're dealing with 1,000 years versus 100 years. <coughs> we have a paper on this. If you want to read it, it's in WR. It came out very recently. It was uh, Laura Reed's PhD dissertation. It's, comp it's really complicated. And we should do away with the return period. It was enough. It was bad enough before non-stationarity. Look at what Gumbel said. This is a paper which has only got, I think, three citations. And I just can't believe it. The expected time until we experience an event larger than the largest observation on record is infinite. Can you handle that? You're going to have to wait till infinity to see something bigger than you saw. And you all have a problem with that. Well, it's just because of the properties of the mean. For random variables, it's not always defined. The mean time is not always defined. And <laughs> it's a pretty important number. <coughs> there are a lot of reasons why we shouldn't be using the mean time to failure. We should be using this. It's reliability. It's used all over the world. It's used for every other problem. Why don't we use it for floods? So for floods, basically for anything, the probability of no flood over an n-year period, you can talk about that as a reliability. You know, when, when um, you know, earthquake engineers use reliability. Fidelity uses it when they plan my retirement. We'll talk about that in a minute. So here, look at what it, is, what it means is that the 100-year flood itself has only a 30% reliability over, 20, over a 
you know, over a 100-year period. Sure, it has a much higher reliability over short periods, but if you're, you know, if you're dealing with long periods of time, a 100-year flood, this reliability tells you a lot more about what's going to happen during the time you're going to live in your house. It, it communicates the risk much better than the average return period. <coughs> it's very misleading, the return period, the average return period. So why not use reliability? It's used for most problems like water supply, hydropower, irrigation. Most other industries use it. For example, let's look at three cases. Earthquake design, they usually use 98% rule. This is how they define it in their books. 98% over 50 years. What's that work out to be? That's a 2,500-year event. But they don't tell you that. What about my retirement? When I, and they, you know, they're very good with fidelity. They give you, they do simulations in my case, you know, if you're, you know, 30 years away from retirement, you know, you want to have your portfolio, or your money last for 30 years, they argue, they, you know, they'll do simulations to make sure it doesn't dry up in the next 30 years with a liability of 95%. In other words, there's only a 5% chance my retirement portfolio will dry up at the end of those 30 years. That's what they say. That turns out to be a 585-year event. Um, and so on. Whereas we start with the 100 and go back, and that turns out to be a 61%. Anyway, it's a caveat of the flood insurance program in America. The 100-year flood probably should be rethought for a whole bunch of reasons, and you ought to certainly rethink about it yourself. Uh, now, it's just, I've only just begun on this, so just quickly, because uh, I, I need to get, and I have, yeah, I better move. <laughs> Um, just to show you that it's more complicated than that, it looks like this, which is way more complicated. And, and it, it, you know, so when the probability exceedance is changing, it, it really gets complicated and, and your, um, uh, the, the return periods really drop. And so all this stuff I've basically shown, but, you know, the, cr the problem you're going to deal with is trying to figure out how to design when, you, you know, when, when th things are changing. Should you over-design for the future? Should you prepare yourself for events which might occur way in the future with uncertainty. So it's a really interesting design problem. And I'm just going to uh, summarize this because I don't have time. It's a wonderful tool to use regression to do all this. Return periods are dead. Reliabilities over future planning horizons are alive and well. I really want to get time to do my next talk because <laughs> it's a bigger story. Determinist extreme flow model is just a stochastic stream flow model in disguise. And vice versa. All simulated extremes are biased. I'm going to give you an example with a water quality model. I'm going to deal with floods, droughts, and I'm going to talk about solutions. And I would talk, I would name this talk, Hydrology is Out of Control. Why I decided to work on this problem for the next decade is because deterministic models are now used all the time for everything we, we, we need. And we, they should be, and they need to be. And so I'll talk, just, just let me get to that in a moment. Bill Kirby of the U.S. Geological Survey, in, his, in an AGU presentation in 1975, said, frequency curves of simulated flood peaks typically have flatter smo slopes, smaller variance than frequency curves of observed floods. Although this loss of variance has been attributed to various kinds of errors in and misuses of data, Theoretical analysis reveals that a substantial loss of variance is an unavoidable consequence of the modeling process. These comments I'm about to talk about have application to all models of any kind, but they are particularly important when it comes to extremes. So follow me. The problem, the problem is that these deterministic watershed models are now used because you need them, because they're driven by rainfall and temperature, and that's climate, and we need to worry about climate. We need to worry about land use. They have land use in them. There's no way around using deterministic models. But if we're really going to go and use them for design, we better listen to what the statistical hydrologists have to say or work together with statistical and deterministic hydrology into one package. And they have to be completely seamless. And that's what this is about. All right. First of all, let's just show an example that we've worked out. Because a lot of this stuff is early and I haven't published so here's an example of some observations of the standard deviation of uh, observations, suspended sediment observations. And this is uh, the observations versus the model output, model output for two different years. 
And what we're showing here are the results from a study, the standard deviation of observed uh, water quality, and uh, observed values and water quality constituents from five sites and, uh, from a study. This is just typical of what you'll get. You'll see this every time you look, no matter what kind of model. You invariable, whatever the constituent, the model standard deviations are always lower than the actual values. It's, you just see it over and over and over. Fecal coliform, dissolved solids, total nitrogen. Why? What do we do about this? Is this okay? Well, let's just take a simple example. I'm not promoting any of these regression models that I'm giving you. I'm just telling you that they make a really, they, they really get the point across and they also are extremely useful. So here's a, 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 a little result that we, we haven't published yet because of um, legal issues, <laughs> uh, su Supreme Court. <laughs> but, uh, but what I can say is that it, it, it's, it, you know, it's, it's interesting results. I don't see why I can't ex present them to you. Appalachia Bay at Cat Point, is, we have salinity observations uh, for a calibrated rain, uh, a salinity model, which gives the salinity in the bay, um, uh, which is uh, very important for the, um, um, for the uh, health in, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the oyster bed. And so what we're trying to do is get a sense of what the extreme uh, variations and concentrations of salinity are. And typically for this application, you try to you use some sort of um, model. In this case, we have a very simple regression model of the concentrations versus flow. And it doesn't really matter so much how much the model explains, so much as I'm going to show you, as understanding the behavior of both the model and the residuals, because all models have residuals. So it doesn't really matter how big the residuals were, as long as you account for them properly. So here, what we see is if you just use the model, what will happen if you just use that model, then every point on the, you're only going to get points that fall on the line. And if, though, if you convert all those points into a frequency curve, it looks like this dashed line over here. In other words, if you just take all, in other, you don't get the variability of the data, you only get the variability of the line, you see a flattening of the slope because the model is just a conditional mean. It's not a model of the concentration. It's a model of the conditional mean. That's why they're always flatter. So the salinity, the slope of the frequency curve of the salinity is flatter than uh, the observations. The observations are all those points. So what do we do about it? Well, you can look at this. You can look at this. Um, um, you know, what you see is, is this in, invariant, in, in, inevitably you see a reduction in the variance. And this is just another way to look at uh, this box plot is, is, a, is another way to look at that same information. I always like box plots if you're going to compare to, uh, to uh, uh, probability distributions. But what we're going to do here is we're going to do a very simple correction. We're going to just take the residuals because we have them. We, collect, we fit a model. We have residuals. They're just the errors. So what we did is we just added them to the model. We, had, we saved our residuals and added them, right? And we added them uh, to a validation, to another period. So this is done, you took the calibration residuals and did this over a validation period. So we're, we're not, you know, this is not funny business. We're going to another period where we didn't have any residuals and we added the original re residuals to the. So, and, and what you see when you do this, whoops, is a correction, a nice correction. What happens is what used to be a flattening is now it just follows the curve. By it. The point being that you got to add the residuals. People are very uncomfortable with adding residuals. Physicists are very, physically minded people are very uncomfortable adding the errors. They want to get rid of their errors and then they throw them away. They calibrate and then throw the errors. You have to keep them and add them. This is very uncomfortable, but you have to do this. This is just a tip of the iceberg of what you need to do, but this is the first thing you need to understand. Um, and, and so you can actually get reproducible results and you can get predictions which have the same characteristics as the data. It's the only way for a model to generate predictions which look like the data. It's the only way. It's the only way is to add the error to the model. And that gives the same as the original observations instead of this compression. Now, there are a hundred other reasons you can get bias. This is just one little part of the whole puzzle, but it's an important one. Now, let's generalize. Is there really a difference between stochastic 
and deterministic simulation models. Well, let's take a look at one. This is a model. F denotes a functional model with precip and potential evaporation and, and model parameters and error. So this is the flow in the river, depends on rainfall, potential evaporation, model parameters, and error. By the way, that's a rainfall runoff model. You know, if I show you a, a stochastic stream flow model, it's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing, except it may or may not have precip and PE coming in as drivers. It might just have parameters and error. But it definitely has this F. It, all models have to have a deterministic. They're not going to just be error. Even a stochastic model has a deterministic component. It's just it's not derived from physics. So I don't understand why we think of ourselves in two camps, statistical, deterministic. We're all in one. We're all in the same camp. Um, so th this is just my you know, notation. We have the observations Q, which are Q, and we have the input data, the precip, and then we have model parameters and model error. Okay. So let's start with something really trivial, because I can, I can work this all out for you. All right? So this is just a rainfall runoff model. I'm not going to use it. It's a silly model, right? But in practice, the hydrologist calibrates the model, and then they use this one, because they don't feel comfortable adding the error. So remember, Q hat is without the error. Q is the original data, because that's how you get the, that's wh where the errors come from, right? So this is the one that you really, this is the real model, <laughs> real model. This is just the one that hydrologists are mistakenly using. Well, you can show easily that the ratio of variances is just the correlation between the two observations, the observations and the simulations. It's very easy to, that's why I did this. I did this simple model because I can prove that because that's really easy to derive, that it's just the correlation. And I, I, so it's really the, I call theta the ratio. It's sort of the reduction in the variance is the correlation. For a perfect model, there's no reduction. It all comes down to how good the model is. With a poor model, and believe me, when you fit models at ungauged sites, this R can get very low. Now, you can also show that for different values of R, you can derive the bias in the, in the peak flow. This is just like the, the peak flow from that model. It's the large, you know, it's the, it's the uh, um, a QP is actually the, uh, um, uh, 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 it's a quantile, the P with the, P, uh, with, with the, uh, with the, um, with exceedance probability P and return period 100. So this is what it works out to for P. This is a standard normal. Anyway, it's a simple result which for this model, assuming the residuals are normally distributed. What you show here is that there's always bias, and it depends on how good the model is. And what it means is there's always upward bias when you're doing working with low flows. In other words, your numbers that from your model are always too big. The small numbers are too big, and the Big numbers are too small, unless you add the error. Now, this isn't a problem if you have an unbiased model and you don't care about floods or drought. But if you have an unbiased model, it is still going to be differential bias, meaning you're going to get downward bias in the floods and upward bias in the low flows, regardless of whether you have an unbiased model or not. So this is a big problem. You can show this more generally. We, we've, we've got a model, you know, this is a, a more, you know, a little bit more detailed model. It's still a silly model. It's not really for prime time use. It's got A and B or the coefficients, depends on how much evaporates and how much infiltrates. Just quickly, it's groundwater. Groundwater is fed by uh, infiltration, which comes in from above, and then the groundwater component is just what, what it was minus what left it in terms of groundwater outflow. And this it's just the ABC model. It was introduced by Harold Thomas, whose advisor was the advisor of Mike Fearing, and he wrote some papers on this for, per and he was trying to show a bunch of things like showing how you get serial correlation in flows. Where does it come from? It comes from groundwater. In this model, he showed that. Let me show you what he showed. He showed this. He wrote a paper in 67 that showed that the mean and the variance and the lag one correlation depended on these factors. So you could look and see, C is the groundwater component, and you could see how and what and the variance of the precipitation. You could sort of explain why you're getting variability and mean and all this. So, so I don't want to go there, but what I do want to show is I extended this. We extended this, we added error, and I rederived the equations. And what we did is we, re we added error, like you should, to both equations, which is what I told you already you need to do. And then we rederived and we found, we, what we found is, is um, is that the mean is not affected, but the variance is heavily affected, and it's by that amount, which depends on the 
an error in both the groundwater, it, it, it depends on the error term in both the groundwater and surface water equations, as well as the uh, residence time of groundwater. And, and importantly, the lag one correlation also has, and every upper moment is going to be impacted by, the, by these terms. So every single upper moment is going to be heavily influenced by the inclusion of, of error. So the error matters. So you're not going to ever be able to reproduce the original properties of the data without adding error. Um, and that's, uh, so, so that was just to show that. And then what we did is we combined that with the storage yield curve. Just to, uh, the, the, you don't really need to see all this because we don't have that much time here. So um, just to show you what, what the results are, this is a, a relationship between the storage ratio. This is one year of storage in the reservoir. And this is the percentage, the yield is a percentage of the inflow to the reservoir. So these are classic storage yield curves. So the, as you in yield increases, the storage, so you know, a reservoir, a bigger reservoirs are needed to get more yield. And it also depends on the reliability. So this is just classic kind of theoretical. Now I'm using a theoretical model here just so I can show all this without data. It's just probability theory. What we show here is that, the, that if you combine all these results, that this is, because this came from another study I was trying, somebody was asking, why is it that all the storage yield curves produced by everybody using rainfall runoff models always predict too much yield? This is why. You see what's happening? What is happening is if you ignore model error, the, uh, you know, but if you don't add model error versus you add error, see, what you, what you think is for a given storage, for a given storage, you have much more yield than you thought. Um, so this is without yield, and this is, so you think you had too much yield. You think you, 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 you actually had, for a given storage, you had, you had this amount of yield, when in fact you really had that yield. So, and the, thi the same thing goes, so um, uh, same thing goes for, uh, um, for, for, for different, um, um, for, 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 for models, depending on the goodness of fit, you'll have much more of a, a variation between the bias, but in general, the yield is going to be overestimated when you don't add model error. And so adding the addition of model error will correct that problem, just like it did for the floods, where it was in the opposite direction. Here we're over-predicting yields, there we were under-predicting yields. Um, now, this is just, I should think this is all just the tip of the iceberg, right? Model error. That, I just tried to show you some like very simple thing you can't refute. You know, kind of like they're just so fundamental. And I could show you results from real models, and then you could ask me all these questions to get us into arguments that don't get to the point. That's irrefutable what I just showed you. Now, but it's but but what to do about it is much more complicated. And what is the why it's the tip of the iceberg? See, the problem is that. We, not on, we don't only have, you know, everything's a random variable. The point I was making here is that this is a random variable and has to be added to every observation that you predict, every simulation from the model. And so you have to know a little bit about, prob actually, this is just probability theory, because you just have to know about the process, the, the, the underlying process of that, of that random variable. This is also a random variable. The, the parameters are random variables. So are the inputs, the precip and the potential evaporation. All of them in each of their own are random variables with properties and complexities of their own. And if you thought that that was interesting, you should see what happens when you do the same thing with these because you get exactly the same results. You get even more systematic bias when you ignore the variability in rainfall and PE and parameters. So what's going on? All the studies that are looking at impacts of climate change on floods, they're underestimating on droughts. They're overestimating. And it's even worse because they don't account for all these. And I, I'm telling you, I, I read hundreds and hundreds of studies. Nobody seems to be dealing with this. And I just don't understand why. I'm sure some of you will here, I'm sure, because you have the background. And, um, so in summary, uh, really, my summary is uh, simulation models are now used routinely for solving water resource system planning, design, and management problems. And, and, and ignoring uncertainty due to climate inputs, model parameters, and model errors leads to systematic biases. Now, there may be other biases that are in, to more difficult to correct. Biases due to model structure, all kinds of other complexities. But these we can solve. These we know how to deal with. 
And treating deterministic models as we have always treated stochastic models can eliminate. In other words, if we do the same, we use the same sophistication that has been used historically to develop stochastic stream flow models, the kinds of sophistication associated with the papers by Witt Klemisch and others here uh, in your very center from the 1980s and the 70s, if we are to integrate those with the current watershed uh, deterministic models, then we have a future. Otherwise, we're, we're kind of out of control. These things are being used routinely for solving just about every problem. I mean, it's crazy, but they're used now to design culverts and design dams and just do all kinds of stuff. I mean, you guys are researchers mostly. You don't know this, but, you know, I was a consultant, and I talk to people, and I know this. I sit, when I go to the ASCE conference, I sit in on sessions and see what people are doing. Rainfall <laughs> models are used for everything. They're do used for delineating floodplains, you know, you name it. But there is no such thing as a deterministic model, according to me. Stochastic stream flow models were once used for hydrologic design. I'm not saying let's go back to them because they don't have climate in them. They don't have land use. They can't solve the problem. But they do include model and parameter errors. You know, people have figured out how to do that. Let's learn from them. And we need to do the same thing with deterministic simulation models. And we need to do it for more than just uncertainty analysis. Um, whoops, that's it. <laughs> I had some more stuff, but that's it. Okay, thanks very much, Rich. You've given us a lot to think about. We're a little bit over time, but oh. I first want to give uh, a student or two in class that maybe didn't have time to ask a question, particularly of the paper this morning, that might uh, want to kick off. Otherwise, we'll uh, move on. Okay, let's go to Saman. And yeah, grab the microphone. Thanks, Saman. Thank you very much for such interesting talk. Uh, on your second half, so what you showed is models are underestimating the variance. I wonder how much is the role of the least square methods to feed the models to data? I mean, for the objective functions like sum of squared errors. If you use another kind of metrics, for example, in a linear case, something that makes your linear function a little more steep, I mean, might yeah. Somehow there's, there, there's, you know, there, you can do, you can use any objective function you want, and you can use any ab, uh, uh, calibration scheme, scheme you like. Uh, the only way to reproduce the variance is either to constrain the, uh, the calibration to do so, but then something else will happen, you know, you, or you won't even be able to get a physically meaningful solution and get that, right? Depending on how good your model is, you're going to give up something else. And it's not just the variance. You're giving up all the other, you know, all the other, it's not just the second moment, but it's the third, fourth, fifth, sixth. It's all the upper moments. The only way forward is to address the problem. And the problem is handling the error. Somehow learning to do business differently. There is no such thing as single trajectories. There's no single trajectory of the future. There's nothing more than, multi, you know, equally likely future object, uh, trajectories. You need, we need to figure out how to use our models to generate equally likely future trajectory, trajectories. I'm not saying that every combination of the parameters is equally likely, but they are generated in such a way that the traces are equally likely. Right. It's, a pro it's a great problem for us, and, and, and we're, we're pretty far along the way because there's a big literature on uncertainty analysis. Right. But it's for uncertainty analysis, which is very similar, but it's not the same because it's just about bounding. We're talking about using the model for simple applications like coming up with a number, <laughs> single number. Really interesting talk. Um, why is error directional? That's really curious to me. Um, and why is it not stochastic? Because it seems that if you've got a systematic bias, it's not actually error, it's error, it's data. Well, no, the, the error is not unidirectional. Is not unidirectional. What it is, is if you can imagine, the model is only giving points that fall on the line, so to speak, right? And so you never get the behavior of the data. The data fall all over the place. And so what happens is you never get big enough values and you never get small enough values. And so that's all. So it's just what I'm, that's it. And so it's just the small ones are too big and the big ones are too small. That's all. But in fact, the, the errors are all hopefully un unbiased and 
uh, right about the line <laughs> or, or the curve or whatever. In other words, you can have an unbiased model and still this happens. In other words, all the models that people are fitting, this is, this is happening. <laughs> Well, Rich, thanks again. You've really made uh, statistics come alive for us uh, today. I think we all got a lot out of this. I want to thank the, uh, the group for coming to our series this, uh, this term and watch this space again for, uh, for this time next year. And thanks again, Howard, for uh, your financial support. Thank you very much. <laughs>